uh, we're going to discuss pyloric stenosis anesthesia for uh, pyloral myotome. So um, we go through pathophysiology and its consequences uh, of uh, in pyloric stenosis, medical and surgical management, anesthetic management, and then uh, continue what they started Thursday night. So, um, so um, just as a background, <clears throat> it's basically what happens is there's a functional obstruction at the pylor as a gastric outlet. And uh, uh, it occurs in about two to four uh, uh, thousand births. Although there's a lot of variations in countries, I think it's less even here in Africa. Uh, commonly seen in males, the ratio of four is to one. Um, it's diagnosed early in life, in three and five weeks, usually uh, three week up to 12 week, uh, uh, baby will pitch. Uh, symptomatic. Mortality is low though, um, if it is managed promptly, adequately. Um, so the exact causative mechanisms are associated with a lot of. Uh, sorry. Okay, so a lot of causative mechanisms are, 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 not, are not known, but a lot of associations are known. There's there some familiar uh, factors, a genetic uh, connection, especially when they are twins, monozygotic twins, they tend to, to, to be associated uh, with, with pyloric stenosis. Um, also associations with regards to uh, high volume parietal cells uh, in the stomach, and which can cause an uh, ups, uh, a disturbance in your management of your gastrin, causing a, a very acidic uh, environment in the stomach. Uh, so that hyper acidity causes that contractions and spasticity of your pyloric uh, sphincter. Also associated with um, pregnant women who who take a uh, microlide like erythromycin? Uh, it's a it's a, a stimulant for 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 the, the, the contractions uh, of the in the pylorus. Um, so uh, those are just some uh, associations with uh, pyloric stenosis uh, or hypertrophy of the pyloric this muscle. Yeah. Um, Someone talking. People are hearing people. Okay. So the child will present to you with um, projectile vomiting, non bilious uh, projectile vomiting. Uh, uh, it's after eating or during eating. Uh, the on palpation, you in the epigastric area, you will find like an olive like mess there. It's a picture of how it would look like. And uh, this is just a transaction of the pyrus, and you see a small, uh, let me see if I can zoom it out. Ah, it's a small opening there because of the hypertrophy there. Um, clinical signs of dehydration would uh, the child would present with it, you know, your sunken fontanel, dry mucous membranes, etc., poor skin turgor, uh, lethargy. Child, children present malnut malnourished with a poor weight uh, gain, um, which is uh, like typical features that they would present with. Your investigations, you will find cause of the hydrochloride that's vomited out, some potassium that's vomited out, some sodium and water. So you said uh, dehydration, 
can be part of your clinical picture. But in your lab results, you find the hypochloremic metabolic uh, alkalosis, um, then hypokalemia. So hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. You can have hypo or hyponatremia with a pre-renal failure. <clears throat> After doing your clinical assessment and you suspecting it, uh, diagnostic test of, uh, of choice is your ultrasound. Um, you'll find this typical donut shape a pyloric region. And uh, on the longitudinal view, the mu muscle would be thick, more than four, more than four uh, millimeters, some say three. <clears throat> and with a diameter, it would be more than 10. Uh, millimeters and your the length of that uh, channel the pyrus uh, it, it, uh, more than also more than 14 and uh, your barium studies let me see if I have another picture here no okay so with the barium studies you you could find uh, something that look like a string there a string sign and because of the folds uh, within the the pyrus you, you, you could see something that looks like a double tracked uh, a sign which we so and and of course the the, the barium collected in in, in your um, pyre region and that could be diagnostic but the test of choice is ultrasound Management, resuscitate the patient, your ABC approach, sure, airway, everything, breathing is fine. And then you address the, the circulatory uh, collapse that might be occurring, maybe the child would be in shock. Or, so you institute fluid management, aggressive fluid management. Um, you can give boluses, start with boluses, 10 to 20 milligram per kg of normal saline. And then you maintain after that adequate hydration. You can use your dextrose containing saline, half and half, half normal saline. If, the, if there's hyponatremia, you can use normal saline just to maintain adequate hydration. You can supplement with potassium, maybe 10 millimoles, you can add them and supplement it. And uh, it's important to keep a, a, a fluid balance chart, urinary catheter, NG tube to decompress and serial electro electrolyte and acid base and blood glucose, which is not important. I think this management would be by pediatricians before us, um, more than our own uh, doing, but uh, that's what should happen before you, you come in, into play. Conservative management uh, for certain cases that uh, not uh, for maybe surgical intervention, or it's an option or parents <coughs> uh, refusing surgical intervention um, or whatever contraindication to surgical intervention. Put a nasal dead on, do a dental tube, feed and get the child to gain weight and obstruction will also disappear gradually. But this can take months. <laughs> and then uh, there, there are reports of atropine being used it, as you know, it's an um, antimuscarinic agent, so it reduces the spasms of the, the pyrus. Uh, yeah, it reduces uh, pyrus spasms. And then, uh, so yeah, it's, as I said, if surgery is, is contraindicated, it's an option. But what's important that, that we should know is that we don't have to rush this patient into theater. So, uh, 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 so the surgery is not... Uh, it's not the, uh, the emergency intervention in this case. It's the medical one optimizing those uh, acid base and electrolyte disturbances before, because there's, uh, there's also a risk of the post-operative apnea, especially if you are alkalotic. Your peripheral and central uh, chemoreceptors are not as uh, active. They are sort of inhibited during alkalosis. And uh, so their response to to your hypoxia and your, your CO2 um, um, would be inadequate. As normally, those would drive you to breathe, to hyperventilate. But during alkalosis, 
that can be depressed. So, <clears throat> yeah. And also uh, addressing the alkalosis, the body might try to, to increase your CO2 by suppressing your breathing. And that can also happen that it suppresses it so much that these little ones uh, would go up neck. So it's, it's so rushing to theater, you are faced not only with the problems that the dehydration, um, the volume uh, depletion, the electrolyte disturbances, uh, acid-based disturbances, but you are also faced with post-op complications that can come. So don't rush it to theater. It's, uh, so it's, it's not an emergency procedure, uh, the pyloromyotomy. It can be performed open and laparoscopic or yeah, endoscopic balloon dilation can also be be, be used. I put a picture of it there. Um, so those are options of performing this pyloromyotomy. It's, 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 it's basically uh, uh, the solution. <laughs> Uh, when, 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 when for, for this uh, uh, pyloxenosis. <clears throat> um, open versus laparoscopic, we all know laparoscopy allows you to uh, a lot of benefits, um, reduce the PON V, and reduce analgesic requirements. And, you know, with this apnea thing, you don't want to give opioids and stuff post op. And, uh, they return to eating quickly, okay? Shorter hospital stay and, and et cetera, so. <clears throat> but the endoscopic balloon is not very successful, but it, it's an option for those who, who are at surgical risk. Coming to anesthesia, as we mentioned, optimize the patient before coming to theater or Push that it, the patient be optimized. There was electrolyte acid base disturbances. Have some targets like sodium above 130, is potassium more than three, chloride more than 90, bike up less than 27, and an output of at least one mil kg per hour. And uh, vital signs, the normal ones per age, according to age. The uh, risk of aspiration is big. So, um, uh, anything or decompressing that stomach uh, is recommended. They pitch with the NG tubes already, some of them. In some cases, you might need to pass the NG tube in theater. Um, um, yeah, so they advise a four quadrant aspiration. Aspirate uh, the, the NG tube while the patient is supine, put on lateral, left lateral, aspirate, prone, aspirate, and then on the right, aspirate and to assist you gastric ultrasound identify the liver and the stomach there um, the content inside the stomach look like the stars in a clear night sky starry night what you'll see after you aspirated you'll see uh, that uh, kissing of the walls and it's, it's flat line it's basically an empty you see the ng tube there still so um, you put it on your Zephyx therma, sternum, the surgical plane, you know, high frequency linear RA tube in theater. And then you start ev uh, evacuating. You evaluate your entrum. So uh, they say if you do this in supine, you might get air artifacts and so forth and fungus. So um, do the twisting around and, uh, and then do the ultrasound on that uh, lateral right lateral position. Anesthesia, uh, they report different uh, options that have been used, inhalational reciprocal induction IV and modified reciprocal induction. Um, in the olden days, they were scared of inhalational, thought it was gonna increase the risk of uh, uh, aspiration filling those, the tummy full of air, while there's obstruction. But uh, I, uh, um, a report from the UK, they saw about 250 something patients were evaluated and they were done on uh, inhalational induction. None of them aspirated or vomited, nothing was reported. So it's, it's something that is an option that you can employ. But just make sure you did that procedure that we just explained. 
antibiotic prophylaxis, yeah, augmenting gefuroxin, whichever you yeah, can use for antibiotic prophylaxis. It's important to you to continue with your fluid management, your isotonic fluid, your saline, or your heartland solution, then will be KG. It's important to check the sugar, follow it up, and then the good analgesia. Um, analgesia are very important. Then the tube may be removed post-op, maintain the IV fluids until feeding is re-established. Yeah, there's a push now to establish feeding as early as possible. Uh, I saw something that says uh, two hours after, but they want, they, they're starting it even sooner, seemingly. Um, after the patient is well hydrated and tolerating feeds, then they consider discharging. Good prognosis after surgery. So I said, post-op apnea needs to be monitored in recovery until the patient is fully awake. And in fact, you extubated. Everyone is saying extubate left lateral position, the patient fully awake, then you extubate. But now post-op, um, <clears throat> fully awake um, for 12 hours, mon um, uh, uh, monitor for apnea. If there's an episode, you might need to add another 12 hours until yeah, you feel that there's no longer episodes of apnea post-op. Take home message, optimize your patient before you just go take the theater or uh, before your GA in surgery. Stomach must be emptied and you can use the ultrasound, gastric ultrasound. Adequate depth of anesthesia is important. It will also help you if you complete neuromuscular blockage. That uh, risk of aspiration will be minimized. <clears throat> and your multimodal analgesia can use blocks, uh, infiltrate the wound. There's no difference in terms of outcomes in the two. You can, can't say one is better than the other one yet. Uh, I think the, the evidence is not uh, yet enough to, to say which one is better than which. But anyway, people have, uh, are doing these different options and paracetamol, you know, try to avoid opioids. There's a risk of post-op apnea, so monitor for that.